We're holding this session today in uh, collaboration with our friends from the Embassy of Poland. And I want to thank them for co-sponsoring and, uh, and for having uh, produced one of their most uh, famous contributors to the global economic debate. Okay, the floor is open for questions, comments, and uh, views. And uh, Barry, back at the back. Barry Wood, economics correspondent. Uh, provocative ideas, but I'd like to raise perhaps some practical matters uh, that the European policymakers must be facing today. Ted Truman last week was saying that what is really happening in the Eurozone is that there was a speculative attack on the Euro institutions and that it's time to uh, at least think of a plan B. So I wanted to ask what the panel might identify as a plan B for dealing with this uh, Euro problem. And if events are fast moving, one thing that a journalist picks up is that, gee, everybody's imposing austerity. If you do austerity in Ireland and Spain and all these other countries, where's the growth? How are they going to service the debt? And Lecek, when you're saying all of these things about the conditionality, <coughs> tiny Latvia or Estonia can do internal devaluation. I think many in this room would have serious doubts as to whether the Greeks can over time. I take your point, Jacob, but over time, how much are the populations of these countries to take? So I just throw that out. How does austerity work in the context of providing the growth needed to service debt? Is it time to begin to think about a structured mechanism for resolving or reducing the debt? And can these countries actually impose internal devaluations? Well, Ted's not here today, but maybe one of his colleagues here at the Institute wants to uh, describe and then uh, address his plan B. Can I, I'm not a colleague, but it sounds to me like a military aggression. You know, speculative attack on European Union institutions. Sounds good, but uh, I think it sounds too much like a military aggression to denote, to, to depict reactions of, uh, say, pension funds. Yes? They are pension fund managers, and they perceive uh, might increase risk, so they react. Why should it be called uh, attack on European Union institutions? This would imply that there is some hidden motive to destroy these institutions. I don't think there is a hidden motive behind this, but I certainly it is not what that okay. has mind. Yes. Well, uh, I think they already put in place Plan B. The ECB has been buying bonds at a much faster rate than over the last few months. Now. I think what is important to understand here is that the ECB is not acting as in, in a monetary policy frame of mind. This is not a quantitative issue. This is intervention in a market that is supposedly overshooting. And I think that's the important thing to understand. So you cannot compare what the Fed is doing with what the ECB is doing because they are doing two different things. Uh, also very quickly, I mean, I completely agree with, with Lecek. I mean, the, the idea that this is a speculative attack, you know, carried out by, by the, all the traditional bond investors, I, I don't think that that actually is true. I mean, this sort of, is, it seems to me to be placating to a discourse that, that you know, the, the European sovereign debt markets is driven by hedge funds and, and those types uh, of investors. And that, I just think that that's factually wrong. Uh, you have a lot of, of traditional hedge funds that are, or sorry, uh, pension funds and insurance companies uh, that are essentially just acting uh, completely rational. Uh, and, and that's what uh, has caused a lot of this so-called uh, contagion. Uh, but with respect to Plan B, uh, as, as I'm going to say, yes, I mean, the ECB is, is already acting uh, in, the, in, the, in the short term on that Plan B. And as I said, I think uh, that what we saw with respect to Ireland uh, is part of that Plan B, uh, which is essentially uh, edging uh, towards some kind of pan-European socialization of at least part of the uh, part of the debt uh, of some of the peripheral countries. In this case, it was Greece. Uh, I think that's part of Plan B as well. Uh, Lessig wants to respond to the second part of the question, which related to the political feasibility of internal devaluations. <laughs> I'd like to broaden the question, Leslie, and put it to you uh, uh, in addition. I think we need some internal revaluation. Um, why is it that there's not an at least equal emphasis on Germany, which accounts for one third of the euro area, which is under absolutely no pressure from the bond market vigilantes at all, to the contrary, 
but is nevertheless also pursuing fiscal consolidation. Now, we know that Germany achieved internal devaluation in the previous 10 years, and that was one of the big sources of the internal imbalances in Europe. So shouldn't we be calling at least equally for some internal revaluation by Germany, as you said, Holland, Austria, maybe a few others, but shouldn't the asymmetric shock be met by some more symmetric uh, uh, internal adjustments. It's the intra-European version of the global imbalances problem, but it's every bit as acute. Okay, let me make <clears throat> then try to make four points. First, <clears throat> I don't think one should uh, reduce all the measures taken or recommended to be taken by countries in problems to austerity and to regard austerity as ultimate evil. <clears throat> As this is the tendency. Everything is called austerity. Austerity, by definition, is an evil. First of all, remember that uh, there has been some reforms, <coughs> like retirement age, which is very difficult to call it austerity. It's, I think it's rather obvious that if people fortunately live longer lives, they should work longer. How, why should we call it austerity? <laughs> This sort of measures. <laughs> well, the best pension reform if everybody works as long as it's possible. So never retires. <laughs> Workaholic. Workaholic. So we like around here. Yes. Yeah. We, like <laughs> <laughs> we vote for that with our feet. First, first, <laughs> first point. Uh, second point, I think one should consider that there is a substantial body of theoretical and empirical literature on so-called non kinshin effects, that under certain situations and because of certain mechanisms, you may, uh, the contraction of certain spending may be expansionary. This is not just pure speculation, I think this has been found out. And I am not saying one should take it for granted. But I should. Uh, but on the other hand, I would should say one should always assume that always any cut in spending is contractionary. It is not true. So some cuts in spending, especially if it is a current spending, and wages, it's uh, maybe expansionary regarding both consumer and investment spending. This is the first point. The second point: what is the alternative to such measures? Permanent subsidization? By whom? So think about what I said. I think the principle of equal treatment regarding countries in, uh, in trouble should mean that countries are required to do what is deemed to be economically necessary, regardless of their social political particularities. In other words, Say Greece has more aggressive and more influential trade unions. This should not be the reason to demand less reforms of Greece, because this would be bad for Greece, I think. <laughs> this would not work, and this would be you know, sort of a moral hazard that would stimulate the growth of aggressive trade unions. So countries which worse socio-political structure should not be treated in a more lenient world. And this is something for International Monetary Fund of European money. Principle of equal treatment, to demand what is necessary. Finally, this is a fundamental issue which uh, uh, Fred has risen. <coughs> Imagine a couple of years ago, Germany was a sick man of Europe. It was growing very slowly. Wages were growing faster than productivity. Wasn't Germany a drag on Europe then? Because it was uh, reflationary, it was uh, growing slowly and was not contributed. Then, for some reasons, Germany has introduced reforms, which make their markets, uh, bargaining, wage bargaining mechanism much more flexible, wage moderation, the growth of German, German economy is faster relative to what would have happened. Why should we demand for them? What should we demand for? Is it bad that they reformed in the past? Should we now demand that they somehow increase wages and they would be losing uh, the, the advantage? This may be a boost in the short run, but not certainly in the longer run. So this is my, my and finally, even if we agree that this makes economically makes sense, I don't think so. What is the enforcement mechanism? Would Greece, Portugal, Spain, 
create an alliance within the European Union and force Germany to increase their wages? I don't think it's very feasible. But let's say, just to pursue maybe part of that last question, what's your judgment on current German fiscal policy? Um, leave aside the wage increases for a moment, but you stressed in your remarks that one of the requirements for a constructive European uh, exit from the crisis is growth. But where's the growth going to come from if the biggest surplus, highly competitive country is also tightening its macroeconomic policy? Shouldn't it, despite your love for the, uh, the balanced budget amendments in Poland and Germany itself, uh, shouldn't that be interpreted a little loosely to permit uh, a source of economic growth in Europe from the one country that's both in a position to provide it and whose critical mass uh, suggests it would have a real impact? I'm afraid I would uh, <clears throat> question your basic promise, premise that more fiscal stimulus uh, would uh, bring much growth, and it was in, in the present situation, including the German. They have uh, the public debt to GDP. Let me see, it's it's uh, 80, almost 80 percent. There is a substantial part of the deficit. Why should they be forced to stop doing something about the fiscal consolidation? Well, this what I am saying is a reflection of my prejudice, certainly my deep disbelief <laughs> about the efficacy of discretionary fiscal stimulus, not automatic stabilizers. And let me say I had this disbelief two years ago too, when I was here in the Washington and there was much talk about job starting the economy by increased fiscal stimulus. I allowed myself to write an article in Financial Times, which was untitled, so I am on the record. Uh, beware of the medicine which is worse than the disease. <laughs> It was not very difficult to point out that assumptions which were underlying the fiscal stimulus were rather unrealistic. I don't, I don't want to say I'm a prophet, but I was not completely proven wrong. <laughs> so why should we continue believing in fiscal stimulus, again, discretionary fiscal stimulus, if a country's debt is 80%? Why? I would rather say one should look at not so much at consumer spending, but at investment spending. And what constrains investment spending? One should not assume that it is only insufficient consumer spending because you would be back <laughs> on the consumer. What about this animal spirits or you know, the investment climate? Are there any regulations, uncertainties? There's a huge empirical work on how uns various uncertainties hamper investment, private investment. So perhaps one should look to this and try to remove sources of these uncertainties uh, rather than just engage in another uh, discretionary fiscal stimulus. I'll help. I, I basically agree with that, but I just want to add, I mean, I'm troubled by the question, right? Because the question says there is all these austerity measures being recommended, where is growth going to come? Now, when you look at all the things that Spain has announced since May, I would say one quarter of those were austerity measures. Two, three quarters were reforms, structural reforms. Has been a major change in the legislation on the financial sector that is going to finally end with the savings banks. That should lower the cost of capital. There has been a major reform of the labor market, which may not be optimal, but it goes a long way in fixing several of the issues that Spain was suffering from. There has been a wave of privatization announcement that happened in the last couple of weeks that are there. I haven't seen a single person saying, because of that, I'm raising the estimates of potential growth in Spain, and therefore the future looks brighter. And I think this is an incredibly biased assessment of the way we are discussing the current situation. True, we are doing fiscal austerity, yes. But there were, I mean, it's not only fiscal austerity, it's fiscal austerity plus reforms. And now, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I can say that it has been legislated or almost legislated in many cases. And I think it's important that the discussion focuses on both things. And then we can argue whether it's enough or not enough. But at least make sure we don't forget the positive part of it, that is, all the reforms that are being implemented. Good, excellent point. Questions, comments? Randy? 
Randy Henning here at the uh, Peterson Institute. I wanted to ask Lesek Balsarovic a, a question about uh, the, uh, the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Lesek, I wanted to ask you a question about the uh, role of the International Monetary Fund in, in Europe. Um, noticing that uh, in the case of the EFSF, right, uh, the decision was made some time ago uh, that the ESFS, EFSF would lend only in parallel financing with the International Monetary Fund, uh, similar to the pattern uh, that we had with, uh, with Greece. Uh, this has been a contentious issue within Europe, whether or not uh, to lend to countries within the Eurozone uh, with or, or without uh, the, uh, the International Monetary Fund as a parallel partner. Now, if we look at the design or the proposals for the permanent mechanism, right, this was also a decision to include the International Monetary Fund in the decision as to whether a country was uh, solvent uh, or insolvent. Right? The International Monetary Fund would make that decision along with the ECB and, and the European community. Uh, so kind of given the uh, controversy that inclusion or exclusion of the fund inspires within Europe, I wanted to ask you about uh, your view on this question. Is including the IMF in such an essential feature of the European architecture a good thing or a bad thing? So we are going back to the controversy, which for me was a bit uh, obscure. <clears throat> A couple of months ago, remember when Hungary and Latvia, both members of European Union, went to IMF, there was no problem. But when great Greek crisis emerged, all of a sudden there was a huge problem. For not very clear reasons why. And it took several months for the European decision making finally to admit. It was pretty easy to ask the following question. <clears throat> why? Why? What were the arguments against? The word European is not an argument, but sometimes it was used as sufficient to say, well, this is European, so European international monetary fund should not be admitted. But it was not an argument. Uh, and secondly, well, at the beginning, European Union did not have anything comparable to IMF. They were not ready to deal with the Greek problem on their own, and they were banning IMF. So this certainly has contributed to unnecessary delays. So, so with respect to the past, this is what I think any reasonable observer would say. <laughs> with respect to the future, I have already asked some question. If European Monetary Fund emerges, what would be the relationship with International Monetary Fund? What effects would it have on International Monetary Fund? Would it mean that International Monetary Fund would stop being a truly global institution? We saw some questions to, to, to deal with. <laughs> Particularly if the same thing happens in Asia. If the, if the pending Asian Monetary Fund, mm. a.k.a. Chiang Mai, also moves in a similar direction, how do they opt? Well, the International Monetary Fund would only be left dealing only with the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> well, it better because that will take a lot of money. <laughs> No, but just very quickly on that point, I mean, I think one of the key things to, to draw out on that, I mean, one, I completely agree with that, check. I mean, it is essentially yesterday's uh, controversy. I don't think there's any controversy about that anymore. I mean, the ideas, the, the, the initial objections were, you know, misguided political pride, uh, in my opinion, uh, in some quarters. I think the, the key, the issue, though, is that, that what, what you have seen uh, with, with the EFSF and, in my opinion, with any sort of permanent future entity is that the conditionality of any lending uh, will, with, with, uh, together with the IMF will be basically, uh, you know, at the uh, sort of the conditionality of the IMF, or in fact, you know, if not going beyond that, it will not be uh, a case of you know the European Monetary Fund lending on more uh, concessional conditions uh, than the IMF. It won't be weaker conditionality. Uh, in, in fact, in my opinion, probably the contrary to that. And I think that that's an important uh, aspect to make, especially if you start drawing comparisons with the circumstances in which you would uh, implement or, or rely on, on, on whatever grows out of the Chiang Mai initiative. Okay, final question over here. Um, well, 
uh, Michael Pomerlan of the World Bank. This, is, uh, this has been a very fascinating discussion, uh, but uh, reluctantly, uh, I would like to point out that maybe it's uh, superseded by events. I sort of had a chance to read over the weekend uh, Rogoff's piece in which it says the restructuring is inevitable in Project Syndicate. Uh, I had Green uh, declaring that the restructuring in Ireland is a calamity. Uh, and then people like Daniel Gross writing two columns in which he's describing the present decisions where two, two restructure, two changes have been done. One is a, a moving from Paris Passu for the European Fund to priority creditor and, uh, and the affirmation that restructuring and bail-ins will be effective starting 2013 de facto are making for a very narrow escape for the debt. So um, he's very grim. Now, a fourth person I respect is Charles Swimsloan that says the same thing. Now, in the context of all these respectable people saying that uh, it's sort of the end game of uh, restructuring, I'm, I'm surprised about the relative pastoral view around the table. So. Okay, Steve, Steve, why don't you ask your question too, and then we'll ask the panel to respond to both. Um, Angel, I just wanted to ask you whether you thought some sort of insurance mechanism, insurance and macro prudential uh, mechanism would be useful for European banks to distinguish their debt <laughs> from the debt of um, sovereign states. Okay, Angel, why don't you take that? Then I'll ask everybody to respond okay. to the broad I mean, the, <laughs> the short answer is yes. I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, it's always been a big hole in the infrastructure of the European uh, system not to have a pan-European insurance mechanism. And, uh, whether you want to do it only for banks or you want to also add it so it can be used to, for the sovereign and then the sovereign can use it for the banks, it's a question of design. But, but essentially the Irish program is a program for the banks, it's not necessarily for the sovereign. So yes, absolutely. I well, think would it be useful to separate the risk of bank failure versus the sovereign failure so that they weren't pushed together in some way? If it was possible to do it right, yes. I'm not sure how to do it right. Because of what I said of, you know, what's, is there an intrinsic uh, reason why a small country or a small state in the U.S. shouldn't specialize itself in financial services and then become too big? And I think that's a question for which there isn't an obvious answer. Well, that would be why you do it on a European basis rather than on a national basis. Exactly. But then the question is, could that lead to incentives that countries want to exploit that and overdoing it from the financial service? I don't know. I'm, 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 all I'm saying is I haven't thought about it carefully. And if it was possible to do it right, probably the answer is yes. But I'm not sure what the right way is. Okay, Lessig, why don't you wrap it up by answering the previous uh, spate of pessimism? Well, I don't know where do they get the certainty. <laughs> they are pointing out to risks which are pretty obvious, but I don't think this book can be um, presented as a certainty. But academics usually are very pessimistic. You know. uh, but let me react to what Jacob has said about the transfers in the European Union. I think one should be very careful about the definition of the transfers. Now, if transfers mean conditional, con conditional lending, which is repaid, it's okay. The problem is that this to be repaid. If transfers meant subsidies, that would be a huge problem for two reasons, and new kinds of subsidies. First, the opposition uh, uh, in some parts of uh, the uh, countries like Germany and others, they're quite understandable. But second, this sort of transfers would crash with, stru crash with structural funds for the new members. So there would be another opposition. So I think Conditionality lending, as long as it is lending, is okay. <laughs> Subsidy is not. It will be huge danger. Okay. Uh, I regret we have to come to a halt. Lessig, we thank you once again. We're in your debt, as always, for sharing your thoughts with us. Great to see you. Thanks to Jacob and Adel. Thanks to all of you for coming. Meeting adjourned.